Alonzo L. Hamby is Distinguished Professor of History Emeritus at Ohio University. A member of the American Historical Association since 1962, Dr. Hamby earned his BA from Southeast Missouri State University, his MA from Columbia University, and his PhD from the University of Missouri. He is a recipient of two National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowships, a Harry S. Truman Library Institute Senior Fellowship, a Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars Fellowship, and the Ohio Academy of History Distinguished Service Award. He is the author of several books, including The Imperial Years, The United States Since 1939, Man of Destiny, FDR and the Making of the American Century, Liberalism and Its Challengers, FDR to Reagan, and Man of the People, A Life of Harry S. Truman. Please join me in welcoming Alonzo L. Hamby. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I am going to try to take you through a little ride on the history of the Democratic Party. It may be a fast ride uh, and uh, may leave you with some questions, which I'll be happy to try to answer when I get through. Political parties, as uh, Americans understand that term, are relatively recent developments. Uh, they were not to be found in the ancient or early modern worlds. They began to emerge only toward the end of the 18th century, as Whigs and Tories in England, Whigs and Democrats in the United States. At first, they were regarded with suspicion uh, as vehicles for individual ambition. The authors of the Federalist Papers didn't anticipate them, for example. They soon became essential vehicles of self-rule because they provided the means of establishing a popular mandate and translating it into action. The Democratic Party of the United States is the oldest such vehicle in the world. It was originally founded to advance the career and ideals of Thomas Jefferson and Jefferson's immediate successors. But it also has demonstrated throughout its history multiple practical and ideological adjustments to changing times and political imperatives. Let's begin with Jefferson and the values for which he stood. In 1776, as the author of the Declaration of Independence, Jefferson laid out these values as eloquently as they have ever been spoken. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government. Well, eloquent indeed, well written in the Declaration of Independence indeed. But what about Negro slavery? And what especially about Sally Hemings, the mixed race slave widely known then and generally accepted today to have been Jefferson's mistress after the death of his wife? Sally Hemings was probably the offspring of Jefferson's father-in-law. 
She had been the personal servant of Jefferson's wife. She seems to have been accomplished and attractive. Um, very possibly uh, having traveled to France uh, with Jefferson and Jefferson's wife, fluent in French. After two decades of controversy and denial, it appears finally to have become widely accepted that the Jefferson-Hemings relationship existed. Uh, I mention it because it exemplifies in microcosm a dilemma that plagued the early history of the Democratic Party. How did Democrats collectively reconcile the Jeffersonian values of liberal democracy with the institution that Jefferson himself practiced of human slavery? For around three quarters of a century in the South, uh, Democrats did so by noisily proclaiming white supremacy. After the Civil War and Reconstruction, they enforced it in what became the solidly democratic South with a widely accepted institution of lynching that persisted well into the 20th century. Uh, and uh, perhaps a bit more mildly, uh, with the institution of segregation, which is the great historian C. Van Woodward showed us long ago, uh, really became an institution only after the Civil War and Reconstruction. To put it bluntly, uh, the Democratic Party, uh, primarily in the South, but with the acquiescence of its northern wing, proceeded from the assumption that democracy existed for white men only. By and large, white northerners quietly accepted this development. Woodrow Wilson, the great progressive Democrat of the early 20th century, Uh, had also been born in Stanton, Virginia, and spent his early years uh, farther in the Deep South. Uh, Wilson, as president, rebuffed a delegation of black activists who obtained a meeting with him. Southerners in Wilson's cabinet instituted segregation in their departments, uh, departments that had uh, under Republican rule in the late 19th and early 20th century been desegregated. Uh, increasingly, however, smaller numbers of Republicans dissented from what had become a national consensus. So much now then for races, uh, for issues of racial equality and the passions they inspired. Uh, we'll return to them. What other continuities do we find in the 19th century Democratic Party? May have been the party of the slavery, uh, but it also was the party of the people. A development widely exemplified early on in the 19th century by the presidency of Andrew Jackson. Uh, a popular general who made himself a national hero by routing the British invasion force at New Orleans in the final battle of the War of 1812. Uh, a leader who had risen from poverty and a slave owner himself, <coughs> uh, Jackson capitalized on his humble beginnings and exploited it as an asset, his identity as a self-made man. Jackson also exemplified the quandary of a party that would be torn between largely incompatible faiths 
and states' rights and strong executive leadership. <clears throat> Andrew Jackson was nothing if not a strong president. He faced down South Carolina's attempts to nullify the so-called tariff of abominations uh, by threatening to lead an armed force into the state himself and quite possibly hang its leaders if it was necessary to compel enforcement. Andrew Jackson was not a subtle man. He also instituted what would become a rather standard, long-standing democratic policy of hostility toward financial elites. He was intensely skeptical of the nationally chartered Bank of the United States, a counterpart of the Bank of England, which might roughly be considered a 19th century forerunner to today's Federal Reserve System. He refused to, bank, to back renewal of the bank's charter, which expired in 1836, or to replace it with some other banking regulatory system. The result was financial chaos and a sharp recession that would be inherited by his successor, Martin Van Buren. Interestingly enough, uh, Jackson's reputation in the uh, popular imagination was hardly scathed. Uh, Van Buren took the rap for the recession. Uh, Van Buren's successors, John Tyler, a Democrat who became a nominal Whig, uh, as William Henry Harrison's vice presidential candidate. Uh, Harrison, of course, lived only a month in office. Uh, Tyler and James K. Polk, elected as a Democrat to succeed him, uh, made the party the tribune of continental expansion. It was they who added, between them, added Texas, the American Southwest, and the Oregon Territory below the 39th parallel to the Union. Impressive in themselves, these accomplishments nonetheless intensified a growing controversy over the extension of slavery uh, that underscored an ominous development. In the 1850s, as the Whig Party disintegrated, the Democratic Party, struggling to preserve its identity as the nation's only truly national party, increasingly became the party of slavery. Um, uh, the party looking for some sort of a formula uh, that would satisfy both the slave South and a northern population that was increasingly trending toward abolition. Uh, the result, probably the irrepressible, inevitable result, the Civil War underscored that image. So did the era of Reconstruction, when Lincoln's successor, his vice president, Union Democrat Andrew Johnson advocated a mild policy toward the South, was impeached, and escaped ejection from office by only one vote. What followed as uh, Reconstruction was more or less settled by uh, caving in to Southern resistance and allowing the southern states to adopt a policy of uh, segregation and black subjugation, just a step removed from slavery. What followed the so-called Gilded Age was an era of Republican dominance marked by impressive economic expansion. As a result, between 1865 and 1913, 
Only one Democrat occupied the White House, Grover Cleveland, for two non-consecutive terms. You know, you can take your pick. Grover Cleveland was either the 22nd and the 24th President of the United States, or you can just call him the 22nd and be done with it. Uh, in truth, the policy differences between Cleveland and his Republican opponents were minimal. Uh, the Republican Party quickly put Reconstruction behind it, uh, and Cleveland was not about to offend uh, the large Southern Democratic bloc in Congress. Uh, and usually a minority uh, in Congress, the Democrats were most often public re publicly represented by unreconstructed Southerners who defended the harsh repression of Negro citizens and the institution of racial segregation. All this began to change in the late 19th and early 20th centuries uh, with the age of reform that has become known as the populist progressive era. Now, populism uh, was primarily a revolt of hard-pressed farmers, primarily wheat farmers in the Midwest and cotton farmers in the South, uh, both caught in the throes of an unfavorable world market that was emerging in the late 19th century. Uh, the first democratic populist leader was, of course, William Jennings Bryan a Nebraskan of formidable oratorical powers. And in his early years, uh, at which he secured his first Democratic nomination for president, 1896, uh, Bryan was concerned primarily with the grievances of these debt-burdened farmers, uh, both North and South. Um, Brian, of, of course, coming from Nebraska, was particularly uh, uh, answerable to wheat farmers. Addressing the federal standard that U.S. currency was redeemable in gold and uh, advocating an inflationary policy, Brian rejected what he called the crucifixion of mankind on a cross of gold and advocated free coinage of silver, uh, in effect uh, a policy that would allow uh, all the silver mined in the United States to be sold to the uh, U.S. Mint and coined. Uh, this would have a significant inflationary impact. Um, most Americans understood it and refused to buy it. Uh, Brian wound up running for president three times, losing each time. He's remembered today, not altogether fairly, uh, but not altogether unfairly either, as the eloquent but simple-minded leader of a rural constituency out of touch with an increasingly urban and industrial nation. Uh, he would go on, of course, to uh, undertake in his later years a crusade against the teaching of evolution in the public schools. Uh, the populist movement, of course, is uh, succeeded by uh, rather more complex reform movement that historians refer to as the progressive movement of the early 20th century. A reaction against the political power of large corporations and an effort to deal with pressing urban problems created by mass immigration and venal political bosses. America's first progressive president would be the Republican Theodore Roosevelt, followed by the hand-picked but 
rather maladroit William Howard Taft. Taft's mishandling of tariff issues and his innate conservatism limited him to one term. It also brought Theodore Roosevelt back into electoral politics as a candidate of the 1912 Progressive Party. Splitting what was normally a Republican vote between them, uh, Taft and Roosevelt paved the way for the election of the Democratic Progressive Woodrow Wilson. And it's Wilson, the Democrat, not Teddy Roosevelt, who was the great reform president of the early 20th century. His list of accomplishments included the establishment of the Federal Reserve System, the stimulation of foreign trade through a sharp lowering of the protective tariff, antitrust legislation, a graduated income tax, an eight-hour workday for railway workers. It was Wilson who appointed the great liberal legal thinker Louis Brandeis to the Supreme Court. On domestic issues, he established himself as the most important president of the early 20th century. Uh, Wilson's big failure came in his handling of World War I. Not in his decision to intervene in 1917, uh, on the side of the uh, beleaguered allies, Great Britain and France. This was morally and strategically correct. Imperial Germany was a clear threat to American interests uh, and to world stability. Britain and France were not. Wilson understood all this. His real failure came with the post-war settlement uh, and his refusal to amend in any way his proposed League of Nations. Um, Republicans, Theodore Roosevelt included, thought that the League, as Wilson uh, established it, had it written into the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, they thought the League uh, just uh, put too much in the way of limitations on American freedom of action in the world. Uh, perhaps it did. Wilson's stubbornness to compromise transformed a great success into failure. A crippling stroke left him disabled for the final year and a half of his presidency. He left office in 1921, a bitter man who had paved the way for 12 years of Republican supremacy. Uh, it would be left after Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover and the beginning of the Great Depression for Franklin D. Roosevelt to create a lasting political world in which the Democrats uh, were the normal uh, majority party. Roosevelt created a vastly larger federal government with a wide mission of social activism at home and world leadership abroad. Agricultural price supports, corporate regulation, protection for labor unions, large relief and public works programs for the unemployed. Um, to this we should say also Roosevelt added a talent for the radio the main means of mass communication during his presidency. Uh, unlike any president before him, and uh, perhaps unlike any president even who succeeded him. By and large, 
Roosevelt's Democratic successors over the past three quarters of a century have affirmed uh, the mission that he outlined, even as they may have tweaked it now and again. Roosevelt also became the leader of the world's struggle against fascism in World War II. He provided the inspiration for Lyndon Johnson's great society programs and LBJ's advocacy of civil rights. Uh, Lyndon Johnson, we should add, first came to Washington as a congressman from Texas during the Roosevelt presidency, uh, was a devoted acolyte of Roosevelt and one of his favorite young congressmen. Uh, no president, not even Ronald Reagan, himself, by the way, an enthusiastic Roosevelt supporter in his younger days, uh, has attempted to roll back the achievements of the New Deal. And no president, not even Jimmy Carter, has abandoned the position of free world leadership that Franklin Roosevelt established for the United States. Well, uh, let's, let's stop with Roosevelt, who I think in many ways uh, established the political world in which we live in today, however much various successors have tweaked it a bit. How might Thomas Jefferson have felt about all of this? Well, the Jefferson Memorial was largely a Franklin D. Roosevelt project. Uh, dedicated during his presidency uh, and uh, really established with his strong support. Roosevelt seems to have assumed that his New Deal and his promotion of the goals of a liberal world order were consistent with those of Jefferson. I'm not at all sure Jefferson would have thought so. But I am certain that the implementation of his values and policy required adaptation to the world of the 20th century. Uh, well, uh, whether today's Democratic Party, for now, uh, at any rate, the party of Hillary Clinton and Tim Kaine, uh, I think it's safe to say uh, a party that Roosevelt and most of his democratic successors until we get to the very recent past would have uh, been quite surprised about. Uh, where is the future of the Democratic Party? What is it? Well, I think the smartest thing for a historian to do on this issue is simply to say, the future lies before us and quit talking. <laughs> And needless to say, I'll be happy to take any questions. May even be able to provide answers to some of them. Uh, you mentioned that uh, FDR was very instrumental in creating the Jefferson Memorial, but the, in the ceiling of that is inscribed uh, that he fought against every tyranny over the mind of man. And it seemed like FDR was the beginning of the tyranny over the mind of man. <laughs> Did you comment on why, he, why that inscription was <laughs> put in there under his aegis? Well, <clears throat> I'm going to defend Roosevelt on that one. Uh, he was, to the to the extent that he was able to exercise any tyranny over the minds of men, it was through radio speeches, um, uh, not, uh, not through a Gestapo. Thank you very much for speaking with us today. My question is regarding what seems to be a switch 
and the policies from the 1800s to the 1900s after FDR, what really caused the Democratic Party to switch its policies from what seemed to be a more conservative tone to what you now see as more progressive, more open to uh, the black community as opposed to segregating it? Um, could you elaborate on that a little bit? I'm, I'm not sure I'm getting it. Well, it seems that back then, the Democratic Party was, again, anti-black, pro-segregation, pro-slavery, and now that all seems to have switched. Well, what would you say well, would be the cause Okay, of that? well, <clears throat> um, the, the big switch, of course, does come in the 1930s. Uh, it, needless to say, does not extend to the Southern Democrats, uh, it uh, is largely pulled off by FDR uh, with a uh, big role being played by his wife, Eleanor. Uh, I think we can say that FDR himself, who was sort of an adopted Southerner, by the way, you know, there's this very interesting chapter in his life after he's stricken with polio in 1921, where he, he winds up spending a lot of time in Georgia um, trying to recuperate uh, from polio at Warm Springs, hoping, uh, vainly as it turned out, that he could regain the use of his legs by exercising there. He's never successful at that, uh, but he is successful in making himself an adopted Georgian and by extent an adopted Southerner. Uh, his wife, Eleanor, during most of this period in the 20s, uh, is not down there with him, but back in New York. Uh, becoming uh, a rather important social reformer in New York Democratic politics herself. And uh, she is, she's quite taken by the plight of the black population, uh, even in the North, and uh, is very friendly uh, to civil rights. Uh, there's, there's no civil rights legislation as such, as bills passed by Congress uh, under FDR because uh, uh, Southern senators will filibuster it. But there are executive actions, notably uh, the Fair Employment Practices Committee of World War II. Uh, but the, uh, the president who really uh, uh, nails his uh, program to the civil rights movement is intriguingly Harry S. Truman, uh, a native of Missouri, which had been, uh, as all of us who have read Mark Twain know, uh, a slave state before the Civil War, uh, and uh, which particularly uh, in certain of its areas was, was, was very Southern. Uh, Truman's own rationale was complex. Fair amount of it was political. Uh, it is uh, both as a, uh, uh, a political candidate in, in Missouri uh, where he had served successively as uh, the chief executive officer of Jackson County, Missouri, which is basically Kansas City in its rural environs. Uh, and then later on as a senator from Missouri, uh, he had needed that black vote. Uh, and uh, he was actually uh, descended from slave owners. Uh, if you look at some of the language that Perry Truman used in private, because after all, he had grown up in a fairly prejudiced environment and carried over into his speech. Uh, you wouldn't think it was acceptable. Uh, but my own interpretation of Truman is that uh, 
He came to believe that uh, civil rights legislation was the right thing to do uh, and that black citizens might be black, but that they were entitled to all the rights of, of citizens. Uh, but uh, that was Truman. Uh, an increasing amount of the black vote went to Roosevelt uh, because uh, by and large, among other things, the uh, federal public works program that he instituted gave fair employment opportunities to blacks. Uh, and when World War II came along, uh, he's, uh, he went along with uh, the agitation for a fair employment practices committee that would try to give blacks a fair uh, shake in the World War II full employment workplace. Uh, so, that's sort of it in a nutshell. I hope that speaks to your question. Uh, by what ledger domain did the uh, name Democrat Party be changed to the misnomer of Democratic Party? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it was probably uh, it was probably an attack uh, uh, levied against a Democrat by uh, uh, teachers of English. I don't know. Uh, it frankly it just doesn't sound right linguistically. Uh, and if uh, if you're saying that uh, a lot of the practices, particularly in the South, weren't democratic. Small d, democratic, sure, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, my question is, you mentioned how FDR led the fight against fascism. Uh, I'm wondering how fascism, what did FDR see in fascism that clashed against his own values and his views of socialism? Well, yeah, there, there are some people who Argue, and then you can make this argument to a certain extent that the early phase of the New Deal, in which its, its central uh, uh, agency, the National Recovery Administration, um, attempted to organize the economy uh, in ways that institutionally uh, bore a resemblance to the way that Mussolini had um, organized the Italian economy. That is, in Mussolini's a case, it was uh, organized the economy into syndicates of like-minded business uh, that then would be regulated by the state. Uh, well, the NRA did the same thing. Uh, only it avoided the use of the word uh, syndicate. Uh, the, uh, uh, the difference is uh, that in the end, uh, the NRA, while well, it might theoretically be telling different kinds of business what to do, uh, uh, might be issuing uh, myriad regulations for them, might have the theoretical power of enforcement, simply couldn't operate that way in a democratic environment. Uh, and it sort of uh, fell apart of its own weight and was, uh, was basically on, on the way out when it was effectively abolished. How do you see the uh, muscular foreign policy of Roosevelt, Truman, Kennedy, and Johnson evolving into the Obama policies? <laughs> well, I guess short answer is I'm not sure I see it evolving at all into uh, the Obama administration. But I think yeah, you're quite right in saying you're looking at muscular foreign policies here. Uh, I think it's... Uh, uh, it's 
fair particularly to say in the case of uh, Roosevelt and Truman uh, that they, uh, they moved in unprecedented ways to protect the national interest uh, and uh, by and large, you know, they were largely right. I think if, if Franklin Roosevelt made any serious foreign policy mistake, uh, it certainly was in his belief that he could establish a lasting mutual helpful, mutually helpful relationship with Joseph Stalin. Uh, of course, he didn't live to see how that probably would have worked out. and. Uh, we don't know how he would have reacted. Um, but uh, how did we get from there to Barack Obama? I, I think Obama is probably best understood as uh, the uh, coming from the latest generation and the wave of the waves actually of reactions uh, against uh, the uh, Vietnam War. And the, well, let's call it what it is, the creeping isolationist belief uh, that uh, the United States has very few vital interests abroad. Uh, you know, I, uh, I suppose if uh, the uh, Soviet Union uh, tried to invade West Germany, we would react. If the Soviet Union decides to occupy Latvia, I'm not sure what we'd do today. And I think that's a dangerous situation. Hi, uh, thank you for coming to speak to us. Um, you talked about earlier about how FDR issued executive orders concerning the equal protection under law for labor. Um, do you and the Democratic Party believe that it is better for one man to unilaterally force a uh, moral policy, such as that equal job opportunity protection, uh, than, uh, than it is better for the people to suffer an injustice until the people themselves come to, come to the conclusion that that policy that they had currently is immoral and they need, that they need to change it? Uh, well, there's no way a fair employment uh, protection agency was going to be, was going to get through Congress uh, at the beginning of World War II. So uh, we have to, uh, we, we have to face that. The, uh, the Southern Bloc in the Roosevelt and Truman Congresses was resolutely dead-end uh, segregationist and would never have stood for it. Uh, there was the problem Roosevelt faced of facilitating war production. Uh, there was a, an emerging, more militant civil rights movement um, led not by the not so much by the NAACP, but by the head of the Railway Porters Union, A. Philip Randolph. Uh, Randolph was threatening if something wasn't done, uh, and get this: this would seem pretty tame to us today, uh, but it seemed much less tame in the atmosphere of the time a mass march on Washington. Uh, and Roosevelt decided, I think, that the march on Washington could be, as many people thought, maybe a messy thing, might become violent. Uh, and. Yeah, we can look at that today and say, well, there have been a lot of marches on Washington since then, and they've managed to stay under control. Uh, that was not so obvious in those days. Uh, so uh, he issued this order for Fair Employment Practices Committee. Now, we should be clear uh, that the powers of the FEPC were pretty limited. 
If an employer really wanted to defy them, that employer could, and he could get away with it. Uh, but it did an operation have, have sort of a moral force in wartime. Uh, and uh, during the war itself, uh, the big, uh, uh, big constantly nagging civil rights issue was uh, whether it would be or could be continued after the war. Uh, I think everyone realized that it couldn't go on indefinitely as a wartime agency established by executive fiat. Uh, well, it couldn't be gotten through with Congress, congressional authorization either. So uh, that, that was basically it. Uh, there was some, some protest about the rapid phasing out of the FEPC, and I, I, I have no particular considered opinion on whether uh, Harry Truman uh, did it too rapidly or not. Truman, um, Truman counted the votes in Congress. He knew they weren't there. Uh, as a former senator himself, he respected congressional prerogative, uh, so he let it expire. Uh, and it would, uh, it would remain uh, you know, an off and on civil rights issue uh, until we finally have the legislation of the 60s. Would you say that if you look at the bureaucracy of our government today, that the problems that were encountered with the NRA have been solved by the bureaucracy today? <laughs> could, could they be solved by the bureaucracy today? Well, haven't they I, been solved by the I, you control? Know, I, I, I think they'd probably be made worse. Uh, the, the, the problem with the the problem with the NRA was uh, conceptual. You know, it was whether uh, whether any agency could provide fair and widely accepted uh, uh, regulation over every significant segment of the economy over the long run. It may have had some utility as an emergency agency. They gave a uh, little bit of a jolt to the economy, uh, but it, yeah, it's, it's hard to see how we could have something like the the NRA existing today over the long run. And as I've suggested, it uh, may not have been an altogether unqualified setback for Roosevelt uh, that uh, it was. Uh, given a decent execution and burial by the Supreme Court in 1935 uh, because uh, there probably just would have been mounting dissatisfaction with it and uh, it would have had to wither away in one way or another anyhow. And so we, we have a question down here in front that we'll get to in a minute. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you very much for uh, speaking in front of us today. Um, my question is with re response to the various factions of the Democratic Party that you've outlined to us today, particularly with regard to the uh, Southern Democrats. If you were to look at the party of Clinton and Kane today with its modern tensions, how would you draw the various factional fa fault lines in their current coalition? Uh, how would I draw factional fault lines in the party today? Uh, well, it's a good question. Uh, when, when Franklin Roosevelt and Harry Truman were president, the governor of Virginia was Harry Byrd, an unreconstructed southerner uh, who uh, was at the head of a powerful Virginia political machine that uh, really controlled the state, and who was uh, widely accepted in Virginia. Uh, Harry Byrd was a reactionary. Uh, the Virginia of today 
is not the Virginia of those days. And Tim Kaine today is a governor that never would have been governor in, in those days. Uh, I think one of the things that's happened in Virginia is, is Washington, D.C. gets bigger and bigger. There's a larger and larger population that lives in northern Virginia and commutes into D.C. Uh, or maybe doesn't even commute, maybe uh, works in uh, one sort or another of government-related employment uh, in uh, suburban uh, D.C., Virginia. So uh, the Virginia of today and its politics is, is much different. Uh, the uh, small government conservatism of Harry Byrd was popular in Harry Byrd's day. Um, Harry Truman once remarked, and uh, he, was, he was thinking not just of Harry Byrd, but also of a uh, uh, Senator Robert Byrd of West Virginia, who seemingly served in the Senate forever. Uh, as Truman remarked, there are too many birds in the Senate. Uh, and he, he found them, uh, found them both uh, uh, real problems for a liberal president. Uh, but uh, as I say, Virginia of today is uh, much different. It's a much more moderate state. It's, uh, it is not the, uh, well, as Harry Byrd would have called it, not the Jeffersonian conservative state that it once was. We have time for one more question. Uh, thank you very much for presenting your information in a way that I could see patterns and connections. I, I deal, deal better with patterns and connections than facts. However, there's something you mentioned as an answer to a question that has been a quandary. You mentioned Barack Obama as tending to be an isolationist. However, I look at the history of what he's been doing, his intervention in Brexit, his intervention in Israeli politics, um, their desire, his desire to bring more Syrians over rather than helping them d develop a safe area nearer home. I can't reconcile those patterns with the term isolationism. If you could clear that up for me, I would appreciate it. <laughs> uh, well, okay, maybe, uh, I mean, you're using it in, I, in a sense in a more inclusive term than I would use it. Uh, I think you seem to be saying that uh, in opposition to immigration, for example, in the case of uh, Syrians, uh, and as far as that goes, uh, uh, the case of uh, uh, Mexicans uh, is uh, required if you're an isolationist. And I think uh, clearly Obama and many Democrats look at this immigration and they see votes, particularly if they're vocally encouraging it. Uh, and uh, the Republicans are vocally opposing it. Uh, so I, you know, I, uh, uh, I uh, don't think, uh, don't think the, uh, the term uh, works very well in that, but uh, as far as, uh, you know, the, we have some very interesting things going on in the South China Sea, for example. Uh, we have uh, some very interesting things uh, going on off, uh, off Latvia when we have an American naval task force in international waters there. We have, Chinese planes, Russian planes, buzzing aircraft carriers. I mean, it's impossible that uh, someday we're going to have a Russian or a Chinese pilot who maybe gets a little too over eager and smashes his plane into one of them. And what's going to happen then? And is it possible to take measures that will, will discourage that? Uh, so maybe isolationist is not quite the best term to use with Obama, but uh, let's say 
uh, he's certainly shying away not only from military intervention, uh, but also shying away from uh, sending military aid to the Ukrainians. Uh, you know, I think probably none of us would want to send American troops to Ukraine, uh, but uh, providing the Ukrainians uh, with armament uh, against Russian aggression. Uh, you know, they, they are, after all, an independent country these days, supposedly. Uh, seems to me something of a different order. Uh, and I, you know, I, I think clearly there's, there's a, lot of, uh, a lot of shyness there. There's a lot of shyness about uh, uh, not trying to do too much about the Iranians who are harassing American vessels in the Persian Gulf, too. Uh, and you have to wonder, sooner or later, is there going to be some kind of an incident when a foreign pilot miscalculates? We'll see. Maybe if uh, Barack Obama is very lucky, maybe not. Thank you, Dr. Hamby. Thank you.